Hello and welcome back to Bookish. A while back, uh, Matthew over at the Bayberry Book Club uh, came up with a tag called, uh, or came up with a tag which was a challenge to try to pick books from yourselves that Steve Donahue hadn't read. And we all kind of, or lots of us, had fun with that tag. Steve had fun with that tag, and I did it. And one of the books that I mentioned in my 10 list, my list of 10 books that I, I wanted to know if Steve had read, was a book called Through the Wheat by Thomas Boyd. And in my tag video, which Steve watched, uh, I mentioned that Boyd was really important to me uh, at a certain period of my life. And Steve expressed some curiosity as to why that was true. And it occurred to me that, you know, I was doing Boyd, uh, to a certain extent, a disservice and maybe, you know, uh, myself as well. You know, it seemed wrong to me that all this time <clears throat> I really haven't shared, you know, what I know about Thomas Boyd. So this that's what this video is all about. So on several occasions I've mentioned and shown uh, the book that I wrote about Thomas Boyd. I wrote a biography of Thomas Boyd, uh, which was published in um, 2006 or 2008, embarrassing, it was published in, I'm going to say, 2006, uh, which was the first really, and to this point in time, the only full biography of Thomas Boyd's relatively uh, short life. Uh, and I came upon Thomas Boyd while doing research for my master's degree uh, on a topic of uh, historical accuracy in World War I fiction. <clears throat> and Boyd's first novel was a novel about his experiences during World War I. And I became really fascinated uh, with the life of Boyd and I did a tremendous amount of research that took me to, you know, archives at Princeton and Harvard and Vassar and um, the Ohio Historical Society and the Minnesota. Anyway, I did a lot of research to come up with what is, you know, admittedly a short book for a man who lived a relatively short life. Um, and I really came to, to believe um, in the course of that research that, that Boyd was a truly lost American writer, a writer who deserved to be remembered more than he was, and a writer whose works at least deserve to be appraised uh, again. I, I make no claim uh, that Boyd was a great writer, uh, that he you know, belongs in the pantheon of great American writers, but he was, I think, an interesting writer. I think he wrote some good books, and I think his life has a lot to tell us about this kind of classic period of 20th century American authors. So that's kind of an introduction to what I want to talk about and what I want to talk about is Thomas Boyd. So here we go with the essentially a hopefully relatively brief life story of Thomas Boyd. Boyd was born in Chicago uh, in 1898. His mother was a nurse who had lived independently as young women were just really being able to do at the end of the 19th century when she met and fell in love with Alexander Boyd who was in fact uh, from Canada and he was involved in some kind of sales position. They got married. His family wasn't happy about that marriage. Um, they got married, and shortly after they got married, uh, Thomas Boyd was born. And then shortly after his birth, uh, Thomas Boyd's father uh, died. His mother had always had a series of recurring headaches, which doctors said had basically traced to the fact that her eyes were a little bit cockeyed, so they did an operation on his mother to correct her vision, which they did, uh, but then they prescribed her laudanum uh, for the pain uh, when she was recovering from that surgery, and she became addicted. And as a widowed, unemployed uh, laudanum addict, uh, Boyd's mother wasn't able to take care of him, so Boyd was sent to live with his maternal grandfather um, in Defiance, Ohio. Uh, his grandfather um, had never approved of his father or or the marriage between his daughter and his father, and he was hard if, um, you know, instructive uh, to Boyd. I think Boyd loved his grandfather, but his grandfather frequently uh, reminded him of his essentially orphaned, almost bastardized, bastard existence. Um, around the age of 14, uh, Boyd ran away from his grandfather's home, and he went, traveled to, um, he traveled to Richfield, Ohio, where he lived with the home. He lived in the home of two, his, two of his maiden aunts on his father's side, and they introduced him to literature and books. They sent him to Ridgefield Academy, which was kind of a military uh, school there, and there he, you know, kind of combined a love of books and a love of military. When World War I broke out, he and friends of his attempted to raise money to buy an ambulance to go to serve as many writers, uh, American writers did, uh, on the Western Front, 
uh, during uh, World War I, but they couldn't raise the money. So when he was just barely old enough, Boyd and his friend went down to uh, volunteer for the Marine Corps. Uh, about a month after the United States uh, got involved in World War I, he went down to a Marine Corps recruiting station and he volunteered as a Marine. He ends up serving uh, on the Western Front in a lot of uh, combat uh, during World War I, and this experience scarred him, shaped him, uh, gave him the material for his, his first book and his most famous book. Um, Boyd was uh, fought at the Battle of Below Wood. Uh, he was in the leading uh, group charging at Soissons and at Mont Blanc and at other uh, battles. He had experience with trench warfare. He had been awarded the Croix de Guerre for rescuing uh, soldiers under uh, shell fire. Uh, during that, uh, during his time, his service in World War One, he was severely gassed uh, near the end of his service, and he, that gassing essentially uh, weakened his lungs uh, for the rest of his life and left him with health problems. Um, he suffered from today what we would call PTSD based on his experiences in World War One, and he was even sent home from the occupying army uh, when World War One was over because of these kind of mental health problems. He moved to Chicago, lived with his mother briefly, uh, and then met his cousin, his cousin, uh, probably about a third or fourth cousin, uh, whose first name, uh, who was named Peggy Woodward. He met his cousin, fell in love, and he moved with her to the Twin Cities areas, Minneapolis, St. Paul, where she uh, was already uh, a reporter working on newspapers and a budding novelist. Uh, and so he was able to get a job working for local newspapers. And in fact, he was able to create a book review page um, in a local uh, St. Paul newspaper. Um, and through that book page, he met a lot of his authors who visited uh, St. Paul, Minnesota, among them Sinclair Lewis and most importantly, F. Scott Fitzgerald. Boyd and Fitzgerald became friends during this time period in um when the Fitzgeralds and Boyds were both uh, in the uh, Minneapolis-St. Paul uh, era. Uh, Boyd ran a bookshop uh, called Kilmarnock Books in uh, St. Paul with a good friend of his, and Fitzgerald was a frequent visitor. Um, Boyd did everything he could to promote Fitzgerald's upcoming new book, The Beautiful and the Damned. In fact, there is still uh, archival footage of, uh, of Fitzgerald uh, typing uh, away with a promotional video about the beautiful and dam, and that was actually that footage was actually produced uh, by Boyd, and then turned over to Fitzgerald for promotional use. Um, <clears throat> he and Fitzgerald became really good friends, and Fitzgerald helped his wife Peggy get her uh, first novel published. And then when Boyd and he encouraged Boyd to write, and when Boyd was ready, he wrote his story uh, about his World War One experiences, which. Uh, Fitzgerald uh, took to and introduced to his uh, editor, the famous uh, editor at Scribner's, um, Max Perkins. Perkins uh, loved the book and got the book into the print uh, in 1923. When the book was published in 1923, Boyd became kind of a, a brief sensation. He was widely hailed as the first American writer to really deal honestly with the war. The book received some criticism for its kind of unflattering portrayal of military leadership and its grim reality. You know, if you go back and read it today, it seems really tame. But for the time period, it's kind of important to remember that, you know, honest descriptions of war and warfare and killing uh, and the feelings of soldiers were relatively uh, uncommon. Um, and so, you know, Boyd was kind of hailed as, uh, as, the, as a great war uh, writer and uh, a great author of World War I. He went on to publish a book of short stories called Points of Honor um, later, uh, or in, I believe in 1925, Points of Honor came out, uh, which basically is short stories about and set around World War I. Most of those are not really combat stories, but stories about you know soldiers behind the line, soldiers uh, after the war, and there are a couple of really good sh stories um, in, that, in that collection. Uh, it's definitely worth uh, picking up and finding a copy of. Recently, uh, a new edition of those stories was published with, I believe, edited and with a forward by um, a uh, English professor named Dr. Stephen Trout, which you can find on Amazon. Um, but those stories then uh, further kind of cemented his reputation. He also published a novel in 1924 called The Dark Cloud, which is a story about a young man 
uh, experience kind of on riverboats, who falls in love with a woman who's uh, with a young woman who's well above his station, and it contains information or kind of a subplot about the Underground Railroad um, in Ohio uh, and in Canada. And it's kind of it's a really an interesting novel. I think it owes a lot to uh, to Mark Twain and to kind of adventure stories at the time. Um, around 1925, though, after Points of Honor was published, um, Boyd became kind of tired of writing about World War I. He wanted to prove that he could, he could write different things, thus that's probably why the Dark Clouds topic was about something else. And what he came to focus on was writing about Ohio. He published a number of short stories about Ohio, and then he published a novel called Samuel Drummond, which is a slightly fictionalized story of his grandfather's life <clears throat> as a farmer, in Ohio, um, and and that novel uh, received pretty good critical reception, even though nothing would ever sell uh, as well as um, as Through the Wheat did uh, for Boyd. But that novel received some fairly positive critical reception, but it actually cost him his relationship with Fitzgerald. Uh, by the time Samuel Drummond had come out, uh, Fitzgerald and um, Boyd were no longer friends, and Fitzgerald wrote uh, a letter to um, to uh, Max Perkins in which he attacked, you know, um, Boyd as you know somebody who uh, locks himself in an apartment and sleeps with other men's wives, uh, which sounds more like Tom Buchanan uh, than Thomas Boyd. But um, anyway, they they had a falling out, and Fitz and then Boyd then continued pursuing these kind of. Uh, Ohio subjects and became really interested in the history of colonial Ohio and he's going to write uh, several books that are kind of focused on this colonial period in Ohio. Uh, one of those was called Shadows of the Long Knives which is about essentially the events taking place along the Ohio frontier centering, centering around uh, Lord Dunmore's war uh, on the Ohio frontier and then he got into kind of biography. Uh, he wrote a biography of um, of a man named Simon Gertie, who was notorious on the Ohio colonial frontier. Uh, Gertie was uh, born into a colonial uh, European family, uh, kidnapped by Seneca Indians and raised as one of them, and then he became kind of a, a leader of Seneca Indians, uh, fighting against the encroachment of American colonists on their land. He wrote a biography of uh, Revolutionary War General uh, Mad Anthony Wayne, Wayne was the uh, U.S. general who won the Battle of Fallen Timbers and kind of secured the Ohio Territory uh, for the United States. From there, he continued to write biography. He wrote one more. Uh, he wrote another biography of another American Revolutionary War general, uh, Light Horse Harry Lee. The problem for Boyd was that by the late 20s, uh, just as his popularity as a biographer was really taking off in the late 20s, that's when the United States economy began falling apart in the lead up to the Great Depression. As a matter of fact, his biography of uh, Light Horse Harry Lee was published in 1931 uh, and its sales really were hurt by the market for books overall and the economic problems. This was really devastating to Boyd who had really kind of been on a roll. Shadow of the Long Knives sold well, which I believe was published in 1927. His biography of Mad Anthony Wayne sold incredibly well, which was published in 1928. And he was kind of on a riding a high um, as an author when everything just kind of kind of fell apart on uh, economically speaking. He went to Hollywood and attempted to uh, to become a screenwriter, something he never really success he never really succeeded at. Uh, even though one of his stories was turned into a uh, movie, uh, the story was called The Long Shot, but the movie was called Blaze O' Glory and it starred um, um, a composer, musician, actor named Eddie Dowling. Uh, that came out in 19, uh, I believe it came out in 1929. Uh, but Boyd goes to, uh, to Hollywood to become a screenwriter, and he, as you know, Fitzgerald, Faulkner uh, had both, both attempted to do that at various points in their career with varying, various levels of success. Um, in Hollywood, he, he, he met a lot of names which you may know uh, from, um, you know, I guess the golden age of American cinema. He met Mary Astor. Mary Astor is the love interest of um, Humphrey Bogart in um, The Maltese Falcon. And from his letters and correspondence, it appears as though they may have had some kind of a dalliance, perhaps. He was really uh, interested in her for a while. He also met Gary Cooper, uh, which 
uh, who was cheating on his wife. Uh, I believe he met her at what was called the Alhambra Hotel, maybe. Uh, and it interests me that, that Cooper met uh, Boyd because of the next phase in Boyd's career. Uh, as, you know, his kind of prospects as a screenwriter fell apart, and as his book publishing or his, his success at publishing books and making money began to fall apart, he became increasingly disillusioned with capitalism. Uh, he had dabbled in socialist ideas. As a matter of fact, he and Peggy were uh, openly socialist in the, 19, in the early 1920s. Uh, but then he turned uh, to communism in the, in the 1930s. Uh, he moved back to the East Coast. He settled in uh, Vermont, um, where he lived in um, uh, South Woodstock, Vermont. He and his new wife, because he divorced Peggy, uh, leaving her with their only child, a daughter, he married his new wife, and they moved to uh, Vermont. And in Vermont, he got more deeply involved in politics. And in 1935, he ran for the governor uh, of Vermont uh, as the Communist Party candidate. He was the official Communist Party candidate and he traveled around Vermont in 1935 uh, giving speeches and running. I think he got less than 400 votes uh, in the election but he did turn to politics there and he wrote two more books uh, both of which have a fairly left-leaning anti-capitalist uh, bent. Uh, the first is called In Time of Peace. In Time of Peace actually picks up uh, with the main character from um, from Through the Wheat and it shows his struggles to try to get a job and be successful and everything he wants to do uh, doesn't work out and in the end he ends up leading kind of a a union um, uh, a unionized worker charge a factory that's been shut down and being shot uh, reminding him of, of World War One and he wrote a biography of John Fitch uh, called Poor John Fitch the inventor of the steamboat which essentially suggests that that Fitch has been has been historically and in his lifetime cheated out of the patent for a steamboat because George Washington of all people uh, didn't want Fitch to get that uh, to get that patent because he, he thought it would hurt him in terms of his land speculating. Anyway, uh, Boyd dies in 1935 uh, in um, in um, oh shoot. He dies in 1935 in Ridgefield, uh, Connecticut. Uh, he was actually at the home of his ex-wife, Peggy, and her new husband because they had begun collaborating, or they had been collaborating on a series of short stories that were basically just published in pulp magazines, uh, like the Modern Magazine, I believe, published some of their stories. He died of a cerebral hemorrhage in uh, Ridgefield, Connecticut, and he was buried there. Um, later on, doctors uh, at the VA uh, approved benefits for his family based on his World War I experiencing, suggesting that he suffered a cerebral hemorrhage in part brought about by his pulmonary problems, uh, which was a direct result of having been gassed in World War I. So a really short but uh, interesting life. You know, Boyd was far from perfect. He was flawed in all kinds of ways, and a lot of his work is, is not very good, but there are moments uh, in his work that where his work is really excellent. He was great at describing action. Um, World War I or colonial battles, uh, he was great at describing um, action. Uh, he was great at showing internal conflict, at least in the minds of, of white men beset either by war or economic problems or things like that. He had a great sympathy for the plight of Native Americans on the Ohio frontier. And he had a tendency to write about whatever he was experiencing. This is actually one of my favorite things about Boyd. One of the things I think makes his life really instructive. Um, World War I, he wrote about World War I. When, his fam when he, when he and, and Peggy tried to buy an old farmhouse in Ohio, that's when he started writing about uh, Ohio subjects. Um, when uh, he got divorced uh, from Peggy, he moved to Reno, Nevada, and he wrote a story about the kind of colony of divorcees or pers prospective divorcees living in Reno, Nevada, pursuing a quickie divorce. Um, you know, when he turned to communism, his work became uh, definitely um, communist in its in its outlook, and he published book reviews um, in the Daily Worker and places like that. I just think that Thomas Boyd led a really fascinating life, and I uh, I I think that his books still think that his books deserve uh, a lot more attention that they get. I've been showing you kind of copies uh, or my copies of his books as I've been talking. Uh, I own first editions of all of Thomas Boyd's books except for two. I don't have a first edition copy of. 
Points of Honor, his short story collection, or Poor John Fitch. And I've looked for these online, and so far the, the prices are well beyond what I'm willing, what I'm willing to pay uh, for, for, those, for those works. Uh, but anyway, I hope you found this interesting. You know, this is one of those things that I obviously have a passion for, and I wanted to share that with you here on my channel. Anyway, I look forward to your comments in the comment section below, and as always, thank you for watching.